Hi guys, um, this is Muriel Swift. Um, I'm 42 years of age. I would like to talk to you about um, my prison experience in 2004. Um, where do I start? Basically, um, in 2002, maybe 2003, unfortunately, I was spiked with heroin in... Um, while well, smoking cannabis, people had put it into the spliffs that I was smoking, um, to which I became an addict. Um, I didn't realise that this was happening to me. Um, I knew that the cannabis tasted funny. Um, I basically um, had never ever thought, like you know, that I'd become a heroin addict, not by any means. Um, to which, um, basically, yeah, I, I. At the time, I was doing a two-year HND in performing arts. I was training to be a fully trained drama teacher. I uh, wanted to basically become a full-time actress, um, to which very quickly my hopes were dashed. Um, and more to do with the fact of the actual system um, failing me and and letting me down, basically. Um, I'd been smoking spliffs for about four months with, containing can, containing heroin, to which I didn't know about. Um, the first I knew was when I'd actually dropped off the lad that had been spiking me, to which um, I said to him I felt very ill, I felt very like jangly, um, I was hallucinating, I was being sick, um, had diarrhoea. Um, I was cold, shaking, I had loads and loads of symptoms of withdrawal, um, to which I told him that um, I wasn't feeling well, and he said, well, you're probably clucking, and I was like, what does the word clucking mean? And he's like, you know, detoxing, and I was like, well, detoxing from what? And he was like, well, from the smack, and I was like, well, what smack? And he's like, heroin. And I was like, what? Heroin? Where Where would I have got heroin from? And he was like, well, me and my brother's been putting it in the cannabis spliffs. Um, straight away, I was very disappointed, very angry that this had happened to me. Um, basically, my own fault through smoking cannabis, I guess. Um, you know, something that I thought that, you know, was okay. Um, I didn't get really, like, sort of to mashed off it and that it was something that helped me cope with a lot of childhood traumas that I'd gone through um, something that helped me to escape and something that just helped me to cope with the mindset that I was in at that time um, on finding out that I had a heroin addiction um, I then basically had gone to uh, the local doctors to get a referral for help um, to which where I live in a tiny little Cotswold village um, they'd never had an em epidemic of heroin before so they didn't know how to deal with me. Um, I was then put on a nine month um, referral waiting list to which that nine months, I mean that's nearly a year, um, that nine months when I actually got to see a doctor, um, I then had to wait another four months before I could even be accepted for treatment. So that was a year and a half. Now, with heroin, what happens is, is very quickly your body come, becomes immune to it. Your um, levels become more and more and more. Um, to which a stage that um, you stop smoking it, you then start chasing it on foil, uh, which means smoking it on foil, to which then uh, very quickly your body becomes tolerant to that. Um, and then basically the next step is injection um, form. And then from that is basically um, your veins pack up and you'll find a lot of people normally go in their groin, injecting their groins. Um, nine times out of ten people would die from this. Now, um, within very quick, short amount of time, uh, my addiction was so great. Um, I had three kids to look after. I had a home to look after. I had pets to look after. I wasn't physically fit. Um, with the detox that I was trying to do myself to cope with anything, um, with the fact that I'm hallucinating, I couldn't get up, I couldn't feed my children, I couldn't look after my children, I was having stomach um, problems, I was having uh, the poos, I was being sick, um, 
hot sweats, cold sweats, hallucinating like you wouldn't believe. Um, if you've ever watched the film Train Spotting, uh, to which you see the baby crawling across the ceiling, um, that that isn't even anywhere anywhere near the actual effects, the side effects that you get from the detox withdrawal symptoms from heroin. Now, let me get to the actual point where I'm going to. Um, basically, after a year and a half of waiting for the referral, by that point, my addiction was already too great. Um, I had to have high level of methadone, which is a substitute, um, heroin substitute, uh, to which unknown to me that, her that the methadone is actually worse of an addiction than the heroin itself. The methadone seeps into the bones. It means, makes the, the aching and the symptoms of the withdrawal twice as bad. Um, basically, um, I did get on a prescription. I was clean for nine months. Um, well, say clean for nine months. I was on a methadone prescription for nine months. I basically um, had a bit of a breakdown uh, due to relationship uh, problems at home. Uh, with my partner and it encouraged me to have a bit of a meltdown to which I used once um, the next day my drug worker came to the prop to my property to come and see me I thought I was doing the best thing by being honest with him uh, being honest with him basically I thought I was being honest with myself and that I could cope with it um, a lot better I thought my drug support worker would support me to which um, within five minutes of me telling my drug worker that I'd used once after nine months, um, they stopped my methadone prescription. Now, uh, the fact that the methadone um, detox is even worse than the heroin, it was very quick um, that I relapsed because of the fact that I had no help. Um, I then basically went, um, got another referral, as you can imagine, it took another nine months for another referral, it took another year and a half before I was seen again. By this point, my addiction had got up to a £350 a day habit, um, not for any other reason than the fact that that's how it works. Your, your body becomes tolerant to it. Um, the more, you know, the more the body becomes tolerant, the more you have to have to bring yourself to a level of where you can function. It isn't a choice. It wasn't a choice. I had no choice. Basically, I couldn't cope. I couldn't survive and I couldn't function without it. Now, um, within that, um, 15 months basically um, my partner and I'd separated he'd ended up um, being put into um, sheltered housing uh, which was full of um, other ex-drug addicts it was full of other uh, it was full of offenders um, and a lot of other drugs unfortunately um, by this point um, basically I'd given up I'd lost all hope I'd lost all faith uh, my life was looking pretty bleak, uh, to which I actually turned then to crack cocaine. Um, I was on Valium as well as heroin, trying to cope with uh, the basically the levels of addiction that I'd got to. Um, yes, I know that, like, you know, saying I got onto crack cocaine and Valium, uh, that looks like I went out of my way to increase my drug um, intake into other substances it actually wasn't anything to do with that it was the fact that the drug um, condition I was in the uh, state of detox that I was in was so great that basically um, I ended up using other drugs to try and um, sort of balance the withdrawal symptoms from heroin now um, basically cutting a long story short um, Yes, I did get another prescription, but by that point it was too late. Um, I'd basically been on the prescription for a space of about two months, I think it was. Um, within that two months, well, within the 15 months of me waiting for another referral to be treated, um, basically I'd gone out uh, shoplifting, I was um, stealing charity boxes. Um, the charity boxes, I you know, I, I didn't steal charity boxes to steal from charity. I stole charity boxes because I didn't want to steal from other beings, other human beings. Um, I know that it, it's no different, uh, but it, it basically wasn't burglaries. It wasn't breaking into properties. Um, it wasn't nicking people's hard, 
earned money. It was money that was put into charity boxes that uh, basically hadn't been accounted for. And at that time, I justified that as my reason. Um, I know that's very hard to understand. Um, and it makes me feel very tearful to state that I stole from charity. And trust me, since uh, my release in 2004, I have done nothing but charity work to pay that money back. Um, Going from stealing charity boxes, I basically got to the stage where um, I did end up eventually uh, committing a burglary. Um, my first offence, um, the woman woke up, found me in a house. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't panic. I basically tried to reassure the lady I wasn't there to hurt her. Um, I'd, I'd realised very quickly at that moment that... I'd put myself in a very bad situation and I'd also made this poor lady basically in fear of her life and it was the worst thing that I could have ever done. <sighs> Sorry. Um, this is what heroin had increased me to do. I didn't want to commit a burglary i basically saw a window up open and because of the drug addiction i had and the great volume that it was i just acted on the addiction not acted on my morals because my morals i would never ever have done anything like that um very quickly i was picked up I was sent to prison. I was um, in prison for two weeks on remand, to which um, they have a team in prison called Carrots at the time. I can't remember what Carrots means. Um, but basically, in that two weeks, I'd had my prescription stopped. I basically, um, you know, got released without any program. I got released without any doctor's help. For me to be released and be referred was another nine months. Whilst my prison sentence, they'd actually increased the medication of detox to much higher levels than what I was on on the outside. To then be released with nothing. And then I was given a £285 discharge grant. Now I'm, de I'm detoxing, I'm clucking, I have children to support, I have children to get to school and I can't do it. I couldn't do it without the medication to keep me off a of heroin and I couldn't get the medication for the heroin without a nine month referral and waiting a year and a half before I got a prescription. Um, I ended up very pretty quickly. Going back into prison for shoplifting, I ended up, um, basically, I'd promised my children if they were good at school that I would get them chocolate and sweets to praise them for good behaviour. To which on that day I'd spent my money on drugs um, because I was detoxing, I couldn't, I couldn't function without it. To which I ended up going into a shop of a lady that I knew very well um, and I stole some chocolate for my children. I got put back into prison again. Um, the same thing had happened. I'd gone in after basically trying to detox myself, uh, trying to reduce the amount of heroin and crack cocaine that I was using. So going back into prison to being put again on high levels of methadone, high levels of Valium, um, high levels of Zoplicone, um, uh, other medication that they gave me that basically make the detox worse than the detox that I had actually had. Um, I was only have actually meant to have been in there a couple of days, but unfortunately I picked up a very severe bug. I ended up um, in there for nearly four weeks. I nearly died. Um, where the prison service basically uh, hadn't realised I was ill. They just left me locked in a room. Uh, well, left and locked in a room. They'd unlock it, but I'd never come out of my room. They just assumed that I was in bed. I didn't want to get out of bed. They couldn't be bothered with me. 
um, it took for other inmates to actually come and uh, speak to me to realise that I, there was sick everywhere, there was poo everywhere, my toilet was blocked. I'd gone in, in a, on a weight of about four and a half stone. I'd got dropped down to about uh, three stone. I was literally at death's door. Um, a letter was sent to the SO. The SO came down and saw me, to which I was treated um, by the by the nurses there and given a lot of cranberry juice. And within a couple of days, I was on video link and released again. The problem that I had was, was again, I was only in there for a short period of time. They'd given me high volumes of medication to which I was then released with nothing. No program, nothing set up for me to basically be able to help me during my detox and withdrawals. Um, very quickly again, within a couple of weeks, I was back in prison um, for nicking a charity shop box. And this was because... Um, I'd been released on probation and my probation officer had arranged to meet me at my home. Um, my probation officer didn't bother turning up. He rang me and basically said to me that I'd got an hour to get to the office, which from here is 25 miles away. I had no money. I had a heroin addiction that was very high. And basically I stole a charity box and in that charity box I had 12 pence in it. I ended up hitchhiking to probation. I got um, arrested within the same day for stealing the charity shop box, to which I was then um, sent back to court. I was then given a, a four month deferred sentence. I had a £350 a day heroin and crack addiction. I should have been locked up and I should have been put in some sort of hospital or on some sort of treatment and program there and then, but they didn't. They released me again without nothing. Now, um, on my release in 2004, I'd basically, um, that was after I got given an 18 month sentence, I went uh, guilty for the burglary that I did. Um, even though at the beginning I went not guilty, I prolonged not guilty. And the reason I prolonged not guilty was for no other reason than I didn't want to lose my children. I didn't want to lose my home because it meant I would lose my children. I fought it and fought it and fought it. But nothing and no help was available for me to get clean from heroin. And I did everything I could to try and help myself, but I couldn't. I basically, um, the day of the court case uh, to the burglary, I basically, I went guilty because I knew that I wasn't going to get the help on the outside. I volunteered my children to my mother's house. Um, in my mother's care with the hope and plan that I would go to prison, get clean, come out, rebuild my life. I'd never had a drug addiction up to that time and I've not had a drug addiction since. I'm 14 years clean. Um, but in that time of my sentence, I basically was meant to have done four months. I should have been released on tag. Um, the day that before I was meant to have had my release, uh, social services went and took my children from my mother's home, knowing that I was um, not under any obligation to not go and uh, get my children as soon as I got out, to which they felt that I wasn't mentally fit because in that four months I had suicide attempted every day, um, cutting, ligature in, because I couldn't cope. Um, I basically, the day they took my children, I hung myself and I died and they brought me back. Because of this, I was then uh, made to do a full nine month sentence instead of four months. And the reason for this was because of the fact that they said that I was a threat to myself and I was a threat to the public. Which, to be fair, looking back, I, I probably was. And if they had a release to me at four months, under the conditions of what they'd done, of taking my children and not giving me the opportunity to actually prove myself, I probably would have ended up back on heroin and crack cocaine, and I probably would have ended up dead within 12 months of being released. So I am grateful that I was kept in for nine months. 
in that next five months from that four months after I hung myself I was given intensive counselling uh, once a week um, to which I um, managed to deal with a lot of things now from the age of five to the age of uh, 21 um, by one gentleman and from the age of five to the age of 12 by another gentleman I was sexually abused I used to have them masturbate in my face over my chest I'm five years of age and they would do these disgusting things to me they would touch me they would put their fingers inside my pussy at five years of age they violated me they disgusted me they took my self-worth and made me believe that I was disgusting that there was something wrong with me that I'd done something wrong to deserve what they'd done to me my father left the family home when I was eight he disappeared for two years he turned up with a new family he had nothing to do with us we were lucky if when he did turn up if we got to see him for longer than five minutes he'd give us ten pound at the car of the window the sexual abuse and that he knew nothing about I tried to tell him he didn't want to know I tried to tell my mother about it my mother didn't believe me no one believed me um my mother when my father left my mum drank for a very long time very heavily she neglected us didn't care um to which I became a mother to my two brothers uh, being the oldest child I had to take care of them and myself um, my mum soon met a chap who was 10 years younger than her no sorry 20 years younger than her 10 years older than me I was eight years of age and he was 18 this man being a young man um, took on a family of three children um, to which he had two other children with my mum uh, at 18 having five children to deal with three that were rebelling because their father didn't care unfortunately he was a very very bad man and he beat me and my brothers on a regular basis um, for nothing he would steal food he would hide the wrappers under my brother's bed and then he would beat my brother for it my brother would wet the bed and then my stepfather would rub his face in his own piss and then couldn't understand why he was pissing the bed every day because he was in fear of being beaten and his face being rubbed in his own piss because he wet the bed because he slept so deeply and it come out years later that he actually had epilepsy and this is probably one of the reasons why he was wet in the bed my brother unfortunately very young was taken into care so there was an absence of a brother a lot of attention had to go into that brother which meant that a lot of attention was taken away from me and my other brother a lot of neglect and low self-worth because of this my brother beat me my uh, stepfather sorry beat, beat me and my brother my other brother for years i'm actually 42 and my stepfather broke my face in half all down here and all behind here only six months ago because of a lack of understanding because he didn't want to talk about something or ask about something my family deal with things with their fists and this is what I had all my life I then got into abusive relationships I had one man try to kill me I nearly jumped up a three-story building because of the fact he tried to kill me I had another gentleman that I got with he was a gamekeeper all my other boyfriends had been like in trouble with the police because of the fact that it was within my nature to go down the wrong path because that's all I'd ever been taught was negativity and to deal with things and to accept things as negative that basically this chap I got with because all my other boyfriends had been so negative and wasn't to everyone's standards I basically got with a gamekeeper lovely bloke I was with him 10 months but I was pregnant with my daughter which wasn't his child 
once I had my daughter, the jealousy started. He didn't like it because of the fact that my attention was going to a child that wasn't his. To which, within two weeks of me having a cesarean section, which I'm not supposed to have sex for over eight weeks, he forced me, well, raped me, to ha have sex with him within two weeks of having a cesarean section. I didn't know what to do. I was unwell. I'd caused myself severe bruising by trying to cope on my own with a cesarean section. To which very quickly I noticed this chap had changed. Now he was a gamekeeper of the uh, local estate up here. Very well known. Very reasonable, respectable man apparently. Uh, yeah. Uh, four months, the chap decided that because of the fact that I asked him to leave my property, because of the fact that he was acting like a bloody 10-year-old child, comparing himself to my four-month-old baby, on asking him to leave, he took out a gun, aimed it at my four-month-old baby's head, and then shot himself in the bedroom in my flat. I had other abusive relationships. I spent 11 years with the father of my two youngest children, where he constantly drank. He constantly um, cheated. He lied and lied and lied. I'd had nothing but abuse, mental and physical abuse from the age of five to the age of 29, where eventually I ended up going to prison because I turned to cannabis because I felt I couldn't cope with the shit that I was being given in my life and that I'd experienced all my life. Things that I'd witnessed at 21, I'd gone to the police telling them that I'd been sexually abused by two different men. Because of the fact that I was promiscuous from the age of 13 to the age of 14, which is what a lot of teenage girls do, it's called learning. It's called, like, you know, experience in life. You soon realise that the boys don't love you, they don't want you, they're just using you. And I didn't know that at the time, like. But at 21, when I tried to go to the police about my sexual abuse by both gentlemen, the police had basically gone to the one chap and I found out that he'd sexually abused his five-year-old daughter and his three-year-old daughter and he'd actually anally and vaginally uh, torn them to pieces. He disappeared. The man's still free now in the Philippines, living his life in a woman's refuge with young kids. And I can't do nothing because of the fact that I've got a record that I've been in prison and I've got a record of being promiscuous from the age of 13 and 14. I've got to suffer for the rest of my life for what these people did to me, but yet this man walks free. To which, yes, eventually I did. I turned to cannabis to escape it. Something just to ease my mind, to get me out of what state of mind I was in at the time. I was self-harming. I was drinking. I was doing a lot of things to try and escape the bad things that had happened to me. No one had ever sat down and talked to me. No one had ever said to me that this isn't normal, that it's not your fault, that you shouldn't carry any blame. For 29 years, I believed that everything bad that had ever happened to me, that I must have done something wrong that I must have done something to deserve all this stuff and if I was God's child then why would God allow this to happen to me and what I realize now is it wasn't God it was the hands of man and it wasn't my fault it was their fault but it took for five months of me going through intensive counseling in prison to realize this after being asked to take hold of that child's hand of when I was young and what would I say to myself? And I said, I'd say I was sorry. And the counsellor's like, what, would, what are you sorry for? And I had to sit there for five minutes and think, what am I sorry for? I didn't do this to me. I didn't hurt me. And I haven't hurt anyone else. I ended up hurting people because of what was done to me. I ended up hurting an old woman by burglary because of drug abuse, because of what these people had done to me. Now, the counselling I had, I had to go through a lot of demons, I had to deal with a lot of stuff, and I had to learn a lot of strategies on how to deal with this without wanting to turn to drugs and alcohol or suicide or, or some sort of way to escape the thoughts in my head. I am now 14 years out of prison and that counselling worked for me. Now, 
for me, I'd gone in for two weeks. I came out for two weeks. I'd gone in for two weeks. I came out for two weeks. There was nothing, no rehabilitation, no counselling, no nothing. There was nothing for me set up on my release. I was set to fail. Even if I didn't want to fail, I was set up to fail by the system because the system doesn't know what to do with people like me. Well, people like me back then, because I'm not like that anymore, because of the counselling worked, the service that I had worked. The nine months I did in prison worked. I was in there long enough to be able to get clean and stay clean and to have the help to change what was in my mind, what was going on. Now, in 2006, this is letters. I don't know if you can see it. House of Commons, Geoffrey Clifton Brown, dated... 2006 now what i did was when i got out of prison i campaigned i campaigned for proper programs to be brought into prisons proper detox programs proper counseling services proper release programs so that when you're released and you haven't got long enough in there you're released with something so you do not re-offend when you're released <clears throat> I watched many of many of girls in the nine months because of the fact that I committed tried to commit suicide they could not remove me from the um, prison that I was in that was only in there for short sentence times uh, for people on short sentences sorry I don't know a remand prison that was it sorry basically because it was a remand prison you would go in there before you would then be sent off to a main prison but because i was a threat to myself and a threat to the public they couldn't move me so i ended up staying in this remand prison 365 girls on that wing i watched two weeks out two weeks in two weeks out two weeks in in my nine months of my prison sentence, do you know what I did? I went round right to every single girl and I asked them about their lifestyles, about their childhood, about everything that they'd ever been through. And do you know what? Every single one of them had said the same as me, that they'd been sexually abused, mentally abused, physically abused, abused by their parents, abused by family members, af abused by friends of the family, touched, sexually abused, buggered. One of them had actually took a knife to herself and sliced her genitals to pieces because of the fact she was so disgusted with herself because of what this man had done to her nothing she'd done to herself what he'd done to her i'd spoken to these girls and basically like you know they told me that they'd gone the same as me they'd gone from broken homes um to you know from sexual abuse and that lot from home to basically like abusive relationships many abusive relationships which just adds to that mental abuse adds to what's going on in here adds to the fact that like you know all that abuse you suffered as a child you're now getting more abuse and more abuse and the thing is you don't realize you're in a cycle of abuse you're in a cycle of abuse because you know nothing different that's all you were taught from a child is abuse and your body thinks it's normal because that's all you were ever taught that it was normal well it's not normal prison systems need to understand that people that are in there 90 percent of those people other than the drug addicts that are out there just to earn and not drug addicts drug dealers and murderers and even murderers like do you know what i mean there's something wrong with them drug dealers i'm sorry they should be locked up and locked up for a very long time but if you go into prison and you're in there because of addiction your addiction should be dealt with now i'm not being funny but now, I'm an addict. I'm an ex-addict and I will be an addict all my life, but I will be an ex-addict all my life. That means that every time that something bad happens to me, I need to find a strategy. I need to be taught a program. I need to be given tools to be able to deal with what happened to me so that I don't make the same mistakes now and turn to alcohol or drugs again to be able to deal with what's going on within my mind. I was able to deal with that because of the help that I was given and the counselling and, you know, given the tools to be able to recognise that if something today goes wrong in my life, that I can say, OK, I've got like, you know, this situation is going to trigger a post-traumatic stress episode, which means it's going to trigger a memory that's in my mind, that's deep rooted, that my mind remembers, but I can't remember 100 percent all of it. But my body will go into a reaction because of it and it will find some strategy, some, you know, some it will find some 
negative experience that will take me to a negative place. And I need it now through my counselling to be able to change that negative experience to a positive experience. So I need to not say to myself, OK, today I've had a really shitty day. Like this person's done this to me. I'm going to go out drinking. Instead, I need to recognise that person did something bad to me. That is that person's fault. Not my fault. I'm not going to go out drinking. I'm not going to punish myself through other people's actions. And this is what I learned through the five month uh, counselling that I had in prison. I'm 14 years clean. I've got my house. I got my children back. I, you know, I did everything and more because the fact that I came out programmed with tools that I was not given as a child to be able to cope with what happened to me through my childhood and through my later life. Now, when I got out of prison and I went to see Jeffrey Clifton Brown, um, I basically my my plan was to make sentences longer because. There's no way within two weeks that you can reprogram a mind to not go out and, and re-abuse, uh, reuse, re you know, substance abuse, whether, it, you know, anything. You need to be given help. You need to be able to be given mental help and tools to be able to come out and live a half normal life. My life will never be 100 percent normal, but it's, nine, you know, it's 75 percent of what it was before I went into prison. Now. Basically, like my idea was, was that um, everyone that goes into prison with any addiction, whether it be drugs, alcohol of any sort, that the uh, program should be given as a detox program and not to treat them as criminals, to treat them as addicts and mental health patients. Now, my plan was that basically everyone that goes in, they get given a 12 month sentence. Within the first five months is basically the detox because that's how long it actually took for me to be able to detox properly off of heroin, methadone, Valium, crack cocaine, methadone and Valium that the prison gave me that were quite happy to release me knowing that I would go out reoffending because of the fact that I couldn't get the stuff because I'd been only in for two weeks. If I was in there for 12 months, I wouldn't have even needed to come out and need to be on Valium or need to be on methadone or anything else. If I'd have been in there 12 months, well, I was in there nine months. I did five months detoxing. I did the other five months. I did doing counselling, dealing with the demons that came to me. Now, I went to see Jeffrey Clifton Brown and Jeffrey Clifton Brown agreed with me. He basically said that I had some really good points and factors that basically the sentences weren't long enough. Um, the carrots team and things like that weren't able within, you know, because of having such short time to be able to work with people and programs. Um, a lot of them were released into halfway houses with other drug users, um, with a lot of money, prison release money to buy clothes and, and food and that. But yet, you know, detoxing, withdrawing from uh, very high substances, um, which, you know, you're set to fail. <coughs> Now, Jeffrey Clifton Brown sent me to see a top MP in London, um, to which I sat down for a very long time and I gave them my whole experience that I wasn't in long enough to be treated the first three times. And that basically it was only because of the fact of my suicide and the fact that I died and I got got brought back and my state of mind that I was actually kept in for five months and had intensive counselling. If I hadn't have done that, I would have been been released again with a high Valium, high methadone detox. I'd have been given another two hundred and eighty five pound discharge grant and even four months still wasn't long enough to have set me up a proper program to come out with. Now, me personally, myself, my view is, and still to this day, is that they should give people proper long sentences. And even, you know, first sentence, not, you know, why did it take four times for them to lock me up and deal with me? 
The first time I went in to do with burglary, to do with a drug addiction, they should have locked me up then, whether it been a rehab programme, whether it been a prison sentence with a rehab programme. It should have had some sort of counselling service, some sort of detox service, some sort of drug programme so that I would not reoffend or reuse when I got out of prison. Now, this top MP in London, I basically said to him, like, you know, you need to be putting people in. They need to be in for longer. They need to be dealt with in prison as addicts, mental health patients. They should be given intensive counselling. And you know, the response I got was one, we haven't got the money. Two, we haven't got the space. And three, how are we meant to make you have counselling? Well, funny, you could make me go to bloody prison. You could make me have bloody probation, but yet you couldn't make me have counselling. I'm sorry, but you could make people have counselling if you pursue it for long enough people give in they eventually break down their barriers become down the reason that people don't want counselling is because their barriers are up they think well how is it going to help me that's all I thought how is counselling going to help me how is counselling going to help me change what happened in the past well it didn't help me change what happened in the past what's happened in the past has happened what it did was it gave me tools and a programme and it gave me the ability to be where I am now 14 years years later still clean with my children back my house back everything and would I would never have got that without the, without the counselling service now I've got a little write-up here of, uh, of about Holloway prison now this is basically um, a little thing that I found off a documentary it was on a couple of years ago as usual you go YouTube um, you try to find it you can't find it or the prison system have had it removed or the government have had it removed because they don't want you knowing the facts but basically in 1968 Holloway prison was opened um, as a psychiatric institute um, in 1983 it was reopened again um, as a psychiatric institute um, in the years of 2000, I'm not specifically sure on what date, because as I said, I can't find the dates, but it was opened again. And this was after someone like myself turned around and said that basically addicts and criminals are mentally ill. They need mental health treatment. I'm not saying it's going to cure everyone because not everyone can be cured, but at the end of the day, like the, the prison was opened, it was all agreed, yeah, 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 like, you know, what I said, that basically, like, these people should be taken in, they should be treated as mental health patients, given the help so that they could rehabilitate themselves to be released and be released for a very long time. Now, um, from what I've been told and from what I've seen from documentaries and research is basically the three times that I know that it definitely was opened, um, Holloway Prison as a mental institution. Um, I don't like to call it a mental institution. I'd like to think of it more of a prison therapy centre. Um, basically, they closed it down because of lack of funding. Now, I'm not being funny, but I can't get a job. I tried to get a job and I cannot get a job because I've got a prison sentence. Now, I could have been treated in a rehab that was set up completely different as a prison sentence. So I wouldn't have had a criminal record. I wasn't an addict. I was mentally ill. And I was a criminal because of the fact I was mentally ill. I was an addict because I was mentally ill. I needed mental health care and attention. Even now... This is 2014. We've had a drug centre here. It's closed down. You've got another drug centre here. That'll be closed down. Lack of funding. Mental health. I can't get mental health. I went to a mental health team here. It was open a couple of weeks. Lack of funding. Now, you know, all the systems are saying all this money that's being given to mental health and to NHS and this and the other. Well, yeah, I'm not disputing that it isn't going into the NHS, but it's not being spent on mental health patients and mental health is getting worse. The suicide rate this year is the highest known in history. And why? Because of the fact that no one is getting help. No one's getting treatment. Um, at the end of the day, like, you know, the, the, the addicts need to be treated as addicts. And yes, they may have criminal um you know backgrounds but look into their criminal backgrounds is that you know are they criminals have they intentionally gone out and done this because of the fact that they're cold-blooded you know murderers or you know just 
drug, uh, you know, drug dealers that just want to make a load of money off of other people? Or are these addicts that are going out, like, you know, people that are drinking alcohol? It, you know, it doesn't have to be heroin. It doesn't have to be crack cocaine. Alcohol. Alcohol is one of the biggest things that is a killer and costs the NHS the most money that you can think of. But yet, it's still being sold on the shelves. No one wants to deal with that. But yet cigarettes, like, do you know what I mean? That costs the same. It costs a lot less to the NHS smoking than what alcohol does. But yet alcohol makes how many billions of pounds worth of money? So they don't want to take it off the shelf. Now, I'm not being funny. I don't agree on legalizing um, drugs, but I do agree that cannabis has been used for MS, it's been used for ME, it's been used for people with a lot of illnesses, aches and pains. Um, if cannabis is used properly, basically the ingredient that gets you stoned is taken out of the product and then you basically buy the uh, product that's left that's used as the pain relief. Now, if this was used, the money from legalising the use of, um, I think it's CBT or ZBD, CBD, uh, which is the ingredient that's cooked out of cannabis. If they was to legalise this, they could basically use the money to be able to fund for rehabs. The money that they make off alcohol, they could use for rehabs. I mean, they're quite happy to sell alcohol. They're quite happy to make addicts, but they're not happy to help addicts. But yet alcohol was the thing that started everything in the first place. Now, you know, at the end of the day, the government know how much money is being made and they know how much money is being made from where and what and when and why. Now, my uncle lives in Canada and they are allowed to grow two cannabis plants per household. Um, during gestation, they then will plant the next two and the next two. Now, you go to Amsterdam, billions and billions of pounds are being made from cannabis. It has been proven that cannabis can help a lot of cancer patients. Um, the main one for me is people with um, dementia and also, um, oh, I can't think of the other... Alzheimer's, basically Alzheimer's, uh, cannabis, CBT um, or CBD, whatever it is, once the ingredient of the actual um, THC is cooked out and you're left with just the painkiller ingredient, um, actually slows down the uh, memory loss in uh, mentally, uh, you know, in terminal patients that have got dementia. Um, there's so many different things that can be done with it. Now, they're not going to legalise cannabis. And the reason they're not going to le legalise cannabis is because of the fact that they've just banned smoking. Now, um, smoking alone, I mean, like, look how many people have got cancer from smoking. Uh, alcohol and tobacco are two of the biggest drugs that are on the market. But yet, you know, we hear about heroin, we hear about crack cocaine, but yet the government doesn't want to talk about alcohol and how many people die every day from it and how many people have liver failure, kidney failure, jaundice. Uh, you know, I could read you a list of, of problems from alcohol, but yet there's billions of pounds being made from alcohol that they could put into proper rehab programs to deal with alcoholics, to deal with heroin addicts, to deal with crack addicts. Now, at the end of the day, like what for me personally, I think they should open more rehab centres. The first offence, if you are caught first offence for anything to do with drugs or alcohol, you should be put into a rehab centre for 12 months, put on a proper programme. And yeah, I think you should be locked up in one room away from everywhere else. So you can't have this, oh, look at me, I'm a gangster. Because you're not a gangster, you're a fool. You are a drug alcohol taken fall that is going to kill yourself and all you will do is line in the pockets of the people that are making the money out of it they don't care about the addicts and at the end of the day i'm sorry but you know when you watch all these prison programs and me personally being in prison myself it was all about gangs it was all about status that needs to be taken away straight away you you know programs need to be done where it's one to one staff one to one counseling counseling should be made available for everyone 395 girls on the wing that i was in and i was the only one that got counseling and i was given it because i hung myself no other reason if if i'd have asked for it yes they'd have given it me but I wasn't in a position to ask for it because I mentally didn't think it would help me 
at the end of the day, like it was because I hung myself that they gave me the counselling. They made it compulsory that I stayed there and that I had the counselling. But yet they're telling me that they can't force you to have counselling. Well, they forced me to have it for five months. So what a crock of shit. What a crock of shit. The government know what they're doing. And at the end of the day, it's, it, you know, they're, they're funding billions and billions of pounds into war. You know, these men are going out to fight. Where does that money come from to pay their wages, pay their bills, pay their pensions? Hey, well, it all comes from the NHS money. It all comes from the people that are working. But yet drug addicts, alcoholics, and anyone with addiction, like, do you know what I mean? We are the problem. We, we, we were classed as the reason that, like, you know, that's where all the money's going. The money is going in the fact that no one is actually talking to the other person and no one is actually listening. If someone was listening, why are we now 2006? I don't know if you can see that. 2006, I sent this letter to Jeffrey Clifton Brown. We are now 2014 and the prison system is at breaking point. They can't even put people in prison because of the fact that there isn't enough room in prison. So people like myself that was left to reoffend four times because of the fact there was no room for me the first time. The first time that I was picked up for burglary on a heroin addiction and crack cocaine addiction and an obvious mental health issue, I should have been locked up there and then. 12 months, without a doubt, a year, taken away, dealt with and, and you know, made to be given a programme, tools to be able to move on. Amen to the fact that I ended up, you know, hanging myself and by coincidence... The chap that cut me down, his name was Mr. Lord. And I'd been reciting the Bible all that day, asking God to come and save me, come and protect me. And you know what? If it wasn't for the fact I hung myself, I wouldn't be where I am now. I'd probably be dead. And why? Because the prison system and the government system would have let me down. They would have let me reoffend, let me continue to do drugs, and they would have let me eventually probably die. Why? Because the fact that they have no money, that's a load of rubbish. They make enough money from alcohol and cigarettes to be able to put into rehab programs. And the amount of money is £500 per week when I was in prison to keep a prisoner in prison. So you imagine that I went in four times. If I hadn't have had the counselling that I had, how many times would I have gone in again? How much money would I have cost the prison system by keep reoffending because of the fact that they hadn't given me the help in the first place? But no, they don't want to listen to that. They don't want to listen to the fact that I know the programme and the programme works. And how do I know the programme and know the programme works? Because I am living evidence. I am here 14 years clean. 14 years clean. I haven't reoffended. I haven't got nothing on my record before and after that three year span that I had of that drug addiction. Nothing. And why? Because of the fact that counselling works. I had five months intensive counselling. I was given the tools to recognise what was going on in my life. I was given the tools to recognise that alcohol and the drugs that I was using with the self-harming. Can you see all these cuts? Can you? Huh? All this mark here from where I hung myself. That was all through the fact of self-harming, alcohol, self-harming, drugs, self-harming. Why was I using it to self-harm? To escape the stuff that was going on in here. Now, the government need to understand that the mental health system is so poor that people are dying every day, whether it be through drugs, suicide, alcohol. This needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed pretty soon, to be fair, because we won't have an NHS system left. The money will be gone. And the money will be gone because of the fact that they're ruthlessly using it on carelessly not putting proper programs together and listening to people like me that is living proof that it actually works. Now, I'm going to sign off because I'm getting quite emotionally upset and I'm quite frustrated, to be fair, that the fact that it's now what we're, we're seven, eight years later 
and still the prison system is in worse well you know the same condition but worse like do you know what i mean holloway it was said by another offender like myself that went in ended up with a counseling service they came out they got themselves sorted i've seen success stories everywhere and most of those success stories are because of the fact they had the right program and the right support because they were in long enough to be treated two weeks in two weeks out two weeks in two weeks out not good enough and what happens you end up becoming institutionalized you end up becoming the fact that that's the only place that you feel safe even though you're more likely to be stabbed and shanked in prison and murdered by another offender that you are on the outside but yet do you know what the prison system are doing the prison system is making offenders the prison system is making people come out and commit these crimes by not dealing with them in the first place i know because i committed them four times because they didn't deal with me the first time and the rehab programs are pathetic. And these rehab, pro, you know, these halfway houses, how, you know, how can you put 20, 30 known drug addicts, criminals in the same building and not think that they're not going to feed off each other, not going to give each other insight into, oh, yeah, I did this, I did that. Oh, yeah, I'll go and do that now because of it. These people need to be treated properly and in a proper care system. They need to be treated with a 12 month sentence in a proper rehab program. I have been criminalized for the rest of my life because I was a mental health patient. I cannot get a job because as soon as they look at my record, they see me as a criminal. I was a criminal because I was mentally ill, because I was sexually, mentally and physically abused from the age of five years of age to the age of 29. I have had situations since then. I have had situations where I've got in bad relationships, where things have gone wrong. And, you know, in the last 14 years, do you know what I've done with those situations? I've handled them with the tools that I was given in the counselling service that I re received in prison. Now, why cannot this be made compulsory? It can be made compulsory. The government just don't want to do it because of the fact they don't want to accept fault and they need to accept fault and they need to accept reality that the prison systems are failing. They've always failed and they will get worse and worse and worse before they get better. The only way they're going to get better is people taking me seriously and taking other people like me seriously, that I am living evidence that the programme works, that a long sentence to detox the person properly of alcohol, heroin, crack cocaine, whatever addiction it is, to get them detox properly, then to give them the mental health service that they need. Face up the prison service, face up the government, that you need to be stepping up and helping people like me that suffered all my life, and then you helped me suffer even more by failing me failing me in every way possible social services come into my house as a child social services yeah they may be better now like do you know what i mean but you know why isn't things being put into schools why aren't more awarenesses being put into place i've seen some things be put into place but it's still not good enough and these parents that say that drugs and sex should not be talked about in schools and that lot and people should not be you know explain things to i'm sorry but you need to wake up to your being just as much as an idiot as everyone else because if i'd have been talked about sexual abuse or talked about inappropriate behavior or talked about drugs or talked about alcohol and talked about it to quite great in depth as a child i might have been able to one recognize that this is not the norm and secondly to be able to accept that the fact that there was a situation that i could have actually gone forward and spoken to people about but because it was kept hush hush and parents don't want to talk about it with their children is the reason that i never talked about it i, ne I never talked about it because the fact that who was going to listen well i hope someone's listening now and i hope that something good comes from this and i hope the prison system can stop putting mental health patients and drug addicts and alcoholics and all all addicts of any form into prison because the fact of their mental health you need to basically over more rehab programs and help people like me i am living evidence i am proof it does work 14 years clean i'd like to leave that with you and i hope this does justice for other people like me 
God bless. Goodbye.